Welcome, welcome, Eva. Uh, so, uh, what we are going to do in this uh, about one hour, we are going to discuss this big issue of uh, future learning. Uh, and we'll try to take it to some high level uh, above, uh, let's say, this technology or the other technology. Uh, what I would like to ask the members of the panel, what will be uh, the key elements in future learning and how should we prepare? Now, let me begin with a few basic things. Uh, so, first thing is, human capital is definitely the most important resource. So, there's no doubt about it. And we need to prepare generations now. Now, the old structure of schools is already uh, irrelevant. It's irrelevant because it was preparing for the old world. Now we have to prepare for the new one. And we'll have to ask the questions, what do we need to prepare for? What skills kids, students, and later workers have to have? A, a key element that was introduced here is information. Everybody agrees that information is a key element. It's a key element in physics as well, and definitely now. Also, we agree that students are cognitively different now. If you look at students at Tel Aviv University, in the past, they would use, uh, they would use a pen and just uh, copy from the blackboard. Now they are not even fast enough to copy from the blackboard. They will Xerox it or photocopy it or do something else. They are very fast, uh, always with their machines, but uh, they, and they are, they are very, very different. So we have to prepare for that. And what we will need is some kind of an integrated solution. I don't believe there will be one solution, but there will be many uh, parameters that uh, will play a role. And I believe that by far this is the most important challenge. I mean, solving uh, the problem of Alzheimer, cancer, or food security, these are all spin-offs of this problem. Now let me tell you a little bit about what we do in Tel Aviv University. You heard already in the morning, and I hope many of you will join us. We do not think only about technology. We think about the cognitive aspects of this. And we are trying to uh, understand what should be the parameters to play with, and uh, what are the skills that we need to give the students, what should be the techniques, and technology uh, will be uh, helpful for us. This parts of it is under the, our online uh, uh, work. Uh, I, I'm also, I would like to invite you on the 7th of July, there is going to be a meeting on cognitive science aspects in, uh, in, uh, inno in, in, and innovation in education at the university. Everything is free, so please uh, join us. Now, what I would like to ask you, so first of all, each of you, I, will ask to, I would like to ask you for one minute to introduce yourself. And then maybe out of the many questions that I prepared for you, one is, what do you think are the goals of education, learning versus teaching? And uh, say a few words about how techno what's the role of technology? And then we will develop the, uh, this. And uh, I will uh, begin with Steve. Good morning. Uh, my name is Stephen Gittleson. I'm the CTO and one of the founders of Light Cell Education. We're a highly adaptive literacy application. We've been going for about four years. We have about a half a million students who read uh, and use our application. We run on both iPads, Chromes, uh, and Android. And basically, in kind of a couple of words, what we do is we use a, a standard, uh, standards-based Lexile level in the United States, which is a um, independent way to measure students' reading ability, and we take that Lexile level and we use that within our application. We have about 10,000 of the best books that students and teachers want to read, and we've uh, added our own custom assessments and closes to the books, and uh, we use that in real time to help students um, improve their Lexile level. So in, in a nutshell, we have what I believe is a true ROI, on our application, and it simply is your starting Lexile level, so we know that by a 30 to 45 minute assessment that a student takes to get a baseline Lexile level. And based on that, we um, serve you appropriate Lexile books, <clears throat> and as you improve your Lexile level, we show you books of a higher level of Lexile, and as you go through the year, we have a predictive um, <clears throat> um, algorithm that will show you your Lexile level, level as you go through the year. It's real time, so students get to see their results, teachers get to see their results. We have a lot of um, gamification within our application, so the bottom line is that students who read more um, grow much faster, and independent um, 
studies through uh, using uh, light cell have proven that students who read 30 minutes a day on light cell will grow 2.7 times faster with light cell than without. And those tests, those studies were done at John Hopkins University and Columbia University. Thank you. Okay, and now maybe you'd like to say a few words about the question. What do you think are the goals of education? <laughs> and the goals of education, uh, I would believe, is to take a student at a baseline as they enter the year and improve their uh, ability to read, write, comprehend. And using technology is just a, an instrument, but you need to have other aspects such as teacher uh, involvement and student commitment to be able to take the level and increase it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yair, maybe you will introduce yourself and also maybe you'll say, what do you think will be the skills that will be needed for our future uh, generations, let's say in 10, 20 years? Okay. So my name is uh, Yair Brosh. Uh, I'm the CEO of Time to Know for the last uh, one and a half years. I assume most of you uh, know Time to Know heard about it. as It's uh, one of the icons in the Israeli uh, tech industry. Uh, I think that Time to Know changed significantly. We are now a solution company that uh, provides solutions to organizations in their digital transformation. We kept our origins that are based on data-driven learning and uh, the analytics, so the session is very relevant to what we do. What we are uh, currently doing uh, is uh, providing tools and services to different companies all over the world. So the model for those who knew Time to Know changed significantly. We're an open architecture system with many, many uh, products, but our main core competency is the solution, the understanding of how to implement digital transformation in different organizations. We're focusing on vocational as well as K-12. And as I mentioned, working all over the world and in the last two years generating significant revenues. Back to the question, we believe that ad te technology is an enabler, uh, first and foremost, to allow different learning. We do see the change, we do see the needs of the millennials to have a different set of uh, education methods. We do see the uh, 21st century core competencies as a, a goal we need to serve. We definitely look at the learner in a different position. We, look, look, we see the learner trying to get the data and, uh, that he wants that would serve what he's going to uh, do and not the uh, institute that is providing or his set, the, set, the original set of uh, learning capabilities. But these are just the first steps. We believe that uh, by getting more data and understanding better the flow of how people learn, kids and adults, we're now talking about K to gray instead of K to 12, uh, the continuous need for learning and the ability to know better where is uh, the focus, where should we focus on, where, is the, where are the legs we need to spend more time on, I think those are the keys and technology is a strong enabler and this is uh, definitely the thing that would enforce the solutions. Thank you. Uh, so Alex, uh, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself and maybe you can uh, uh, you know, give your uh, point of view on the following. I mean, in the past, we had to teach people how to hunt and uh, how to uh, grow food, right? Later, they had to learn how to ride a horse. What are they going to need to be able to do in 20 years? Do they need, for instance, to know arithmetics? Okay. Or Shane, can we give up uh, arithmetics? So okay. Um, I'm Alex Tong, the Vice President for Business Development uh, Internationally uh, for ATA. And ATA, just a very brief description. Um, in this new age, ATA is a dinosaur, it's an it's a old company. Uh, why I'm saying that? Because we have been there for 17 years in China. And uh, while we start our company uh, back in 99, um, uh, last century, and um, we actually open up the uh, outsourcing of a very important process of education in China, which is testing, assessment. So uh, we believe assessment is the core component of the whole learning process, even at that point of time. Although 
we do understand that it has been put placed at the very end of the learning process in the past, but now the education technology and internet and all these beautiful things that enabled us to actually incorporate the assessment into the learning process, which I totally agree with what Newton is doing, that we are able to provide a lot of it meaningful information for educators, for teachers, and even for students to start understanding whether they are following the right kind of learning path and having the right kind of learning experience to be more effective throughout the whole education process. So this is our belief that um, with the background that we have every year, we deliver roughly about 10 million tests over like 400 test titles in China. Uh, we do have a lot of data on hand. Uh, in the past, we don't know how to, how to deal with it. There's just information. But for the last five, six years, uh, we found out that we are actually sitting on a gold mine. This kind of gold mine is going to tell us a lot more information about our candidates. Um, not just at the end of the learning process, but throughout the learning process itself. So that's roughly about our company and our vision. And uh, going back to your question, I think it's very simple. Um, in 20 years time, we have to teach students how to learn instead of learning what. So that, that's what I think. But going beyond that, I think the technology itself, after 20 years, we wouldn't be able to even imagine. But what we do understand is it will be becoming more effective and less effort, and it would be merged into our daily life. We shouldn't have any classroom with the same age. We shouldn't be having a teacher standing in front of us. That's for sure. But the rest, we are only guessing. Okay, thank you. Uh, but you said what is no, but I didn't know what is yes. I mean, should they know arithmetics or no? Should they, should they know arithmetics? Should they know the multiplication table? Is it important? Of course it's important. It is important. Okay. There are some people who dispute that. Uh, okay, uh, Eva, uh, maybe I'll ask you uh, a more difficult question. <laughs> uh, so, uh, it seems that uh, most of the work that we are doing is working on transfer of knowledge. We transfer knowledge, but probably this is not very important. What is more important, for instance, is to develop originality. How will we develop originality in the kids? Not just transfer of knowledge, teach them how to do, to be able to do the next thing, because this is, be, is going to be much more relevant for them than just knowing something. So what should we do? Yes, that's, that's a very good question. Um, so I think it has been said several times before on this panel, technology is a tool of empowerment um, for the individual student, and that is how we as Newton see ourselves as well. Now, originality, of course, might increase and might develop with different applications of personalized learning. That can either be in terms of product, but it can also be in terms of environment. And for both of these, we heavily, as Newton, as a personalization engine company, we heavily depend on our partners. We do not create contents ourselves. We also don't directly produce any products, educational products ourselves, but we see ourselves as direct consultants and heavily collaborating in making educational products as successful as they can be in the market. So to answer your question, I would say this is not something that we as Newton can answer ourselves, but I do believe what we can leverage is our knowledge, our international knowledge, and work with local partners, with um, partners that are specific to an educational system that have expertise in gamification, um, in any type of pedagogy that will motivate a student to become more original in his or her way of learning, and we hope to provide the best experience of personal learning to complement that experience. Okay, thank you. So maybe a question to all of you, you have an experience already in developing uh, various tools. What are the obstacles that uh, you see that, uh, for learning? What, the what do you see that kids find as obstacles for learning? What should we overcome? And uh, maybe we just do it uh, one by one. I think, <clears throat> I think that, um, and this partly answers your question before about uh, creativity, um, and that's kind of front and center to what we do, which is just 
you know, kids reading is a, a phenomenal uh, jumping board to creativity to if you can get kids to read again it, it's I've seen it many times in classrooms that I visited that use light cell and it's kind of amazing when you see kind of the spark the light go in their head and they they, they really get interested in books again there's a tremendous um, challenge now uh, across the world to have kids read just you know old-fashioned reading and if we can get kids back into reading reading is the core fundamental baseline to any type of education so um, I think reading is still going to be around for a very long time and we can get kids to, to uh, be interested in reading and find it challenging is a, is a great step and done. Okay. So uh, when looking at uh, learning, actually the learning process uh, uh, for kids is uh, changing dramatically. Think about a kid that is uh, entering uh, pre-K or uh, kindergarten or first grade. They're already used to use those devices, the technology, the, the rhythm is like they're moving. Uh, while as a lot of the core structure is still a, working in a different rhythm. So part of the issue is engagement. How do you get those kids that are used to high uh, frequency of uh, different kinds of inputs into an environment that is uh, moving in a different rhythm? And again, we believe that technology is definitely uh, has a key role in that. The way we develop our product is geared towards engagement. We provide th strong authoring tools that allow different kind of access to the same kind of data. So you can practice it ve uh, via videos, animation, reading, uh, or uh, any other media that still tags to the same level of content. The role of the teacher changes. So we do believe that teachers are there and they are there to stay. We do believe that the role is different. And what we're trying to do is empower the teachers, allow them to get this amazing data that is being collected and get the insights from the data. Because as you mentioned, data is being collected. The question is, what are the insights? How do you take and make good use of that uh, uh, data? in a very short time because the teacher won't have the time to do the analytics. Someone needs to bring the specific insight on a specific kid or a classroom or a group to the teacher in a very real time, if you want, environment or scenario. So maybe you describe for us a class. There is a class of 45 minutes, kids is nine year old, the teacher of mathematics comes in. What is going to be different? Today she comes, she goes to the blackboard, she writes some stuff. What is going to happen in 10 years? What will happen? So first of all, we believe that uh, the role of the teacher changed. So you don't need to actually, the teacher is not passing away data. The data is there at the reach of the, t uh, the tip of the finger for every kid today. So if I would imagine a classroom, I would imagine kids that are already exposed to data in different levels in a personalized way, meaning each one of us based on his or her experience and knowledge would get into the system, the teacher would be able to facilitate groups, working groups, the interaction is a key, and the focus is on how we learn our kids to learn, and not how do they repeat and uh, uh, do more and more practice on the same piece of data, but how to engage them and get them moved to the second step and solve problems that they didn't solve in the past. So Alex, maybe also you make a comment on, uh, I want to develop curiosity, passion, that people would like to learn, you know, kids would like to learn. How do I do it? Well, I came across a terminology 20 years ago called edutainment, meaning that we combine education and entertainment together. Um, at that point of time, because a lot of people believe that education is boring, and they suffer, but I don't think nowadays it has to be the case. So to increase the, um, the kind of um, incentive and motivation um, by using kids' curiosity and uh, their daily life, how they interact with others and parents and the surrounding is actually will be the key driving point of the whole learning process. We shouldn't be asking the kids to come into a class to learn something. They should be coming in for a reason. Say, for example, if a school posts a, posts a task or a project to ask them to complete, they could choose to find it on the internet, they could choose to ask their 
classmates, or even ask their parents. If they are unable to do that or unable to find an answer, they should be joining a small course or joining a small 20-minute class to ask the teacher or together with those students having the same issue to stay together. Not for the reason of they are being the same age. They should be for the reason of having the same needs. So I think the future scenario should be based on what they are asked to do and to resolve their problem through learning. Learning is just something natural that comes in. I see. Uh, okay, Eva, I would like to ask you, I would like to teach my kid uh, critical uh, thinking. He shouldn't believe everything that he's seeing. Maybe this is correct, maybe this is incorrect. I want to teach him that. What should I do? Very good question. So, um, I think technology should always be a fully inclusive um, part of any educational system or also any classroom experience. So in order to teach critical thinking, I don't think technology will be the only solution. And I know we are currently at an EdTech summit. However, technology can definitely help a student uh, learn new ways of critical thinking. Um, from, through the personalization lens, what I can say is that we would understand very quickly how the student learns any concept most effectively, be it mathematics, be it English, and you can already see an increase in critical thinking just by giving him or her the right piece of content in any given point in time. But at the same time, uh, us as Newton, we also believe that the power needs to be given to the teacher, and by providing um, analytics, by providing an overview of a classroom and of an individual student, we actually want to free up time that the teacher can then productively and effectively use in the classroom experience. And that certainly uh, includes one-on-one -on -one coaching, but that also includes classroom discussions, for example. And I think that's where critical thinking is also being developed. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, let me pose another question. I would like the kid to be able to take risks. It's going to be very important for him in the future. How, should technology, how can technology help me in that? I want him to learn to take risks, not to do the simple thing. Who wants to answer? <laughs> I can uh, jump in, try it. Please. Uh, when we look at the uh, uh, learning process, I think that we shouldn't stick to one uh, specific method. Uh, the key is blended learning. And I think whether you're talking about uh, learning how to deal with risk or how to do better creative thinking, you can allow a kid to challenge himself via different environments. Some of them could be technology. And you can definitely set a scenario where by technology you can uh, actually allow a kid to experience in a different way, whether it's by an animation, a video, a simulation of a scenario, and, get, and then connect that into a discussion. The social interaction is a key. What w the key would be how to create the content in a way that would be engaging over time. So if you create enough uh, scenarios in which the learner is exposed to risks, if you want to, uh, and allow him to experience success, gradually you'll get to the point where you're aiming. And I think that Again, platforms that allows that variety, platforms that would allow the learner to be exposed to different kinds of uh, uh, experiences would be able to provide it. So the old schools, if you look a few hundred years ago, the, w the reason why they were constructed in the way that it's done, like, uh, you know, and we still have it today, is basically they were, use they were generating photocopies of people. People who know basic skills, reading, writing, arithmetic, a few things, and then, and it, it was needed. We needed to generate photocopies. It seems that maybe in the next generation we don't need photocopies. So how are we going to make it that they will look different, that they will do different things? Uh, what will be the difference compared to uh, previous old schools? Uh, what are the key things that they all have to know? And what are the other things that they, you know, we can give up on that? From the old curriculum. Well, um, maybe I could jump in on that. Um, I think there are a set of skills that are necessary for kids or for 
the education investors to ensure that kids all get it. And above that line, uh, any kids could have their own way. Because uh, even if you try very hard to photocopy them, uh, they wouldn't be the same because of character, because of their experience, and their, their attitude to life. So what I'm trying to say is classroom is something that we incubate individuals. It shouldn't be the same group of people. But still, the bottom line is to having the skills to survive and, and, and live in the society in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the right sense. But what are these basic skills? What, do, what, what does everybody need to know? What is the minimum that we have to ask everybody to know in the next generation? So, first of all, we can definitely look at the 21st century uh, key skills as some sort of, of a baseline, but I definitely think that when you look about the learning process, the key would be how do you uh, engage with new material and how do you cope with it. So the key is to learn how to learn more than anything else. And I think this is done by exposure to different kinds of materials in different ways. I do think that the, the way we consume the learning, we, we can actually, when we look at the learning process, we should look at vocational training versus K-12 training. When you look at the vocational training today, you look at the learner in the center, and actually, if you want, he's asking us, the ethic environment, to provide him the data he needs in order to reach the point he wants to be in the future. I think students in the future would be closer to that scenario where, for sure, we're not photocopies of each other. Uh, I, it's a, even... A, Part of our vision is uh, personalized learning and how do you fulfill each uh, person uh, potential under the assumption that each one of us has a huge potential and the key is how to unlock it. So definitely uh, no photocopies, definitely allowing personalization, both to the educator to allow to express himself and bring the kids to the point we want them to be, and for the learners to allow themselves to learn differently. because. Even if we're interested in the same subject matter, we'll in each one of us will get there in a different pace, in a different way. And uh, this is the challenge that we need to allow uh, educators to deal with. And I can just yeah. add to that. So I think um, our vision for the future is as well a fully student-centric uh, perspective, a student-centric learning experience. One of the examples uh, that we have uh, when we apply our algorithms is uh, goal setting. So over time, both the student can set himself goals. I want to reach a certain exam score, for example, or a certain understanding in um, a mathematics concept, for example. But we also give the teacher the ability to set goals for his or her classroom. And I think this already gives us a lot more flexibility and also a lot more guidance principle than we did um, in the past. And uh, the nice thing about adaptive learning, as the term says, is that it, in real time, fully adapts to what the student is currently learning. So rather than only realizing a potential or also a strengths and weakness profile at the end of your educational system, you can actually realize that and fulfill your potential much earlier on, and hence not be a photocopy of another student. Let's talk a little bit about how we measure the success. I mean, you, in your slide, actually, you showed a certain percentage of success. But that's a success in knowledge. How are we, because by what you were trying to say, I thought, is that knowledge is important, but that's more, not the most important thing. We have to teach them how to learn. They have to know the basics, and from then on, they are on their own. Mm -hmm. How do we measure the success of that? So in LightCell, it's pretty straightforward because, as I mentioned before, we have the Lexile level. So uh, a student starts off with a baseline level based on a comprehension um, assessments they take. So they know what their entering Lexile level is. And you know, with, a new with a new generation of 21st century students, you know, instant gratification is something that you know, they've come to expect. So uh, as they go through the books that they want to read, they're assessed every couple of pages uh, through closes and assessments, and by the end of the book, they get uh, through the gamification, they can get awards, uh, badges, and they, and they understand right away whether they're moving up, down, or staying the same. There's a lot of transparency with their, with their 
uh, with their uh, students in their class so they can collaborate and using those different things amongst many other features we have within the application, transparency, collaboration, uh, instant gratification, once students are engaged, uh, the progress that they make is phenomenal through using positive engagement. So I think that, uh, again, if you look at technology, there is so much you can reach with technology, but technology can allow the educator to be available to do exactly what you're talking about. So I think that efficacy and understanding where the student is or the learner in the learning process is easier using technology. But the fact that technology can allow the educator to be free and actually take the role of how do you take the student and how do you allow a student to really engage in the challenge of learning and how do you uh, give uh, the teacher actually the role of grading where we are. And again, I'll, I'll look at uh, vocational training. When we are hiring today, it's not necessarily only the university certificate or the college certificate. We look at uh, colleagues and see what do they think about the skills. We look at references. I think the teacher plays that role now, and I think we look at skills, softer skills, mainly by the interaction with the teacher and his evaluation of those capabilities. So not everything would be by technology, but technology will allow it in an easier way. Well, to me, I think your question um, would invite different answers in the area of K-12 and for professional learning, I mean for lifelong learning. Um, for lifelong learning, it's more easy because it, there's a goal, there's a standard test, a qualification that they could achieve. So easily, if they fail the exam, so it's no good. If they pass the exam, then the learning process is good. At least maybe painful, but it's good. But for kids, K to 12, it's very different. You just finish the, um, the comp compulsory years at a school and push them out to, uh, to work or go to universities. Then you really don't know whether you did a good job or not. So what we need to do is just like uh, the past few days, I went to some good innovative schools in Israel and um, I listened to presentations from, from high school students who actually came together, 10 of them form a company, and then um, it trying to, to, to raise fund, um, not because they really need that money, but it is a task that they find that they could accomplish uh, in real life. So the kind of skills that requires to identify problem find a solution, and find out why they are able to, to resolve that, and then design a product and invite investment to invest into their company. I think this is what we could say, I would say this, this school has really done a good job, because this is what they will be confronting in the future, in the real life. That's, that should be the measurement. From my point of view there, three different points that I would uh, like to, to mention to answer that question in measuring success. The first one is quantitative efficacy. I showed some examples earlier. What is the actual increase, a percentage increase, um, in results that are being achieved by students? The next one is more qualitative. So what are both students themselves, but also teachers noticing in the classroom, but also in the higher education environment or the vocational training environment in terms of increased motivation? And the third one is the actual communication between teachers and students, in whatever context that is. Through personalized learning, we hope to have a more iterative and more direct feedback loop between both teachers and students. And I think that is also critical when measuring success. Uh, you, saw, you talked about entertainment. Should we teach, uh, I, when I watch kids uh, playing video games, they can play for nine hours. Exactly. Should we use video games in order to uh, teach them? I think we, we don't want to narrow that down into entertainment. I think the best type of learning is the kids learning without knowing that they are actually learning. So gamification is only one way of doing it. So having a good fun and, and good dance or a good conversation with the others while they are learning is the best way of learning. 
So from your experience, the relationship between the kids, it's a, it's a critical element in the learning, namely the joint work of uh, kids together. Definitely, I think that collaboration is a key. Definitely when we look forward and what we expect kids to be, one of the skills is uh, the ability to communicate and collaborate. And again, having that the kids practice it from early age at school in different groups, again, this is where technology can really make a change. You can free time and allow the students to learn not only in the classroom, in those micro moments on the way, at home, and take the time at the classroom to practice collaboration, give tasks to, ta to practice it after school, but uh, this is definitely a key parameter. Okay, so let me summarize. It seems that we agreed on the following. We need to develop uh, some ecosystem to uh, educate a life learner from the beginning to the end. Everybody has his own uh, naming for that. We need to, to teach them basic skills and then teach them how to learn. We need to have them engaged, work with others, and use information only as a tool, uh, not just simply transfer of knowledge, but actually to be able to do the next thing. And uh, I think I will summarize in the following, since I come from Tel Aviv University, and we work uh, in research and development of these directions, both from cognitive sciences, from technology, machine learning, etc. Whoever would like to join us in our research, in our meetings, uh, please uh, feel free. And we have 15 seconds to go. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.